Today it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker to you. Born right here in the Bay Area, Michael Ellsberg is a renowned expert in entrepreneurialism, career development, and education whose work has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, and Good Morning America, to name just a few. Michael is author of the incredibly popular The Power of Eye Contact, Your Secret for Success in Business, Love, and Life, a book that provides simple tools for improving relationships throughout all areas of your life. He also writes the Need to Know blog for Forbes.com, which is full of even more valuable tips for personal success. His new book, The Education of Millionaires, It's Not What You Think and It's Not Too Late, will be released on September 29th, but we were lucky to get a few pre-release copies over here if you're interested. Um, while the workplace today often places heavy importance on a person's alma mater, for his new book, Michael spent the past year and a half interviewing some of the world's most successful individuals who did not obtain a college degree. Instead, these individuals were self-taught and learned the skills they needed for success through their experiences in the real world. In his talk today, Get Rich and Investing Your Own Human Capital, Michael will explain how to make the most fast-acting, direct, high-impact investments in your own human capital and career success based on what he learned from these masters of self-education and from his own personal experience. And with that, please join me in welcoming Michael Ellsberg. So what I plan to do in the next 45 minutes is to radically alter the way you all think about the concept of investing. Now, you are all highly accomplished engineers, managers, uh, executives, professionals in Silicon Valley, the heart of innovation of America. Um, you all work for legendary company in the history of capitalism. So for me to stand up here and say that in 45 minutes I might uh, alter the way you think about a concept as fundamental as investing is a tall order, but that is what I'm going to aim for today. So I'm not here to talk about stocks, bonds, real estate, 401ks. You've all heard those kind of lectures before. Um, you, you all kind of know the rap about that kind of investing. Uh, the type of investing I want to talk about is one you've probably heard less about because it's discussed a lot less, but I think it's very, very important. And that is investing in your own human capital. And the title of the talk today is Get Rich Investing in Your Own Human Capital. Uh, if you haven't guessed already, it's a slightly tongue-in-cheek title. I wanted to poke a bit of fun at all those books about the other kind of investing. You know, Get Rich Investing in Real Estate. Uh, but in all seriousness, I do think that investing in your human capital uh, can be potentially much more lucrative than all those other kinds of more traditional investments. Um, it's, as well, it, it's possibly much more safe, which is something that we're all interested in now, you know, given just the craziness of the markets in the last several years. And it also can be possibly more rewarding uh, and more fitting in with the kind of fabric of your career and your sense of meaning. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. And I'm going to start with a pretty uncontroversial statement. We'll get to a bit of controversy later, but let's start with uncontroversy. Most economists, most career development professionals will agree that spending your time, spending your money, investing in human capital is a really good investment. So you're not going to find many people who disagree with that statement. But almost all the discussion around that concept focuses on investments in formal credentials and formal higher education. And those can be very powerful investments. And I know that Google, as a corporate culture, highly values educational attainment, educational investments in its employees and its recruits. And you've all probably in this room made a lot of those investments. And those can be very powerful, very worthwhile investments. But almost all the discussion centers around those. And there's a whole world of investments that I've been exploring for the last several years, talking to very successful people who didn't go that path, who kind of bootstrapped their human development, their human capital. And so if you think of formal education, it might be thought of as a, almost a venture capital model of investing in your in your human capital, in that there's often a lot of financing involved, uh, a lot of effort and money up front, you know, 18, 16, 18 years to get through 
uh, elementary school, undergraduate, you know, more years for graduate education. And then after all this investment and all this potentially financing and debt, then you get some benefit afterwards. Uh, and what I want to talk about today is styles of investing in yourself that can just be put into action right now. Not a lot of expenditure of money. You don't have to leave this wonderful campus where there's all this free food available that I've already been enjoying. Uh, and you don't have to take time off from your career. You don't have to go into student debt. Uh, it's available to you right now. So these might be thought of as more of a bootstrapping model of human capital development. Uh, or a lean, lean is a very hot word now in, in the kind of investing entrepreneurial Word, world, or you could think of it as a guerrilla style of investing. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, now, before I dive in, who am I? Why the heck do I have any credibility at all to be uh, talking with you about this today? Um, so I'm a professional author, book author. Um, this is my second book that's been published. There's a few before that weren't published. I won't talk about those. Uh, but this one is coming out in a couple weeks from Penguin. Um, it's called The Education of Millionaires. Um, you're actually some of the first people to hear about it or even see it. Um, I just saw this book like two days ago for the first time. And what I did is I, I got very interested in this question of how can you develop your talents outside of the normal ways that we hear about developing your talents, going back to school. And to explore that question, I decided to interview uh, some of the most successful people on the planet who don't have college degrees. And I went around the country. Um, I talked to about 35 millionaires, self-made millionaires, entrepreneurs uh, who didn't finish college, about four billionaires. Um, some of them are pretty famous. Uh, Dustin Moskovitz, co-founder of Facebook. Um, I talked to Sean Parker, founding president, who, by the way, if you've seen uh, the movie The Social Network, I think he is totally different than <laughs> Justin Timberlake. Uh, they did him a disservice in that, that movie after hanging out with him for a couple hours. Uh, and, and, and picking his brain about this stuff. Um, I interviewed Matt Mullenweg, who's the founder of WordPress. Uh, I run my own personal blog on that. Probably a lot of you are familiar with WordPress. Um, outside of the tech world, uh, I spoke with John Paul DeGioria. Uh, he's the co-founder of John Paul Mitchell Systems. He was homeless at two points in his life uh, early, um, lived out of a car with his son, uh, and was at one point collecting soda bottles to make sure that he had enough money to feed his son. And he went on, he went in business with a hairdresser called Paul Mitchell. They invested, I think, like $700 in creating their first formula. They went salon to salon, built it into a multi billion dollar business. And he's been on the Forbes 400 forever now. Um, and another person on that list I interviewed. Uh, it was Philip Ruffin who uh, started out building a hamburger chain, not even a chain, a stand, a hamburger stand in college. Uh, he eventually decided to drop out to build that, uh, built it up quite successfully, just kept building businesses. Now he owns Treasure Island uh, Resort and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. So. Um, a bunch of you know famous people. I also just interviewed people you probably haven't heard of, but who are just doing really, really interesting, cutting edge things. Uh, the inspiration for my book actually was my wife Jenna, who's uh, here in the front with with my mother. Uh, and Jenna is a successful entrepreneur. Um, she has a, a thriving weight loss uh, coaching practice and wellness center in Manhattan. And she dropped out of college in Australia. So she was the inspiration for me getting excited about this topic. For the record, I did graduate uh, Brown class of '99, so I'm not uh, an example of the people that I write about. Um, So we're going to get into some really specific takeaways that I want to give you in this, in this next 40 odd minutes. Um, you're going to come away with some really specific things you can implement for your career success. Before we dive into that, I want to get a kind of more Google Earth view uh, of, of the issue, and then we'll zoom in um, uh, more specifically towards the end of the talk. And we'll also have plenty of time for questions. So the Google Earth view. In my write-up for this talk, which you may have seen or not, I'm not sure, I, make a, I start out with a comparison about 
two different types of people. Take uh, a billionaire executive, you probably know of a few here at this company, um, or you know, just someone who is at the top of their game in the corporate world, and then you take someone who's earning minimum wage, uh, which is around seven fifty an hour these days. Uh, these two people don't have very much in common professionally. They pretty much couldn't be more opposite professionally except they have one really, really important thing in common. Can anyone guess what that one thing they have in common is? They both have 24 hours in the day. I don't care how much money you have, there are ways you can use money to leverage your time, but I don't care how much money you have, even if you owned all the stock of Google on IPO day and cashed it out that day, all that money could not buy you a 25th hour of the day. So we're all working with 24 hours, so then the interesting question becomes, you know, what distinguishes these two kinds of workers who have the same amount of time to work with? You know, why is one earning so much more than the other? And it's quite dramatic. If you know, the average executive compensation for CEO of a major corporation is around $10 million uh, in, in both salary and stock options and benefits. Um, I know that uh, Larry and Sergey were at one point taking $1, so they're not the best example here, but your average CEO of a large corporation is around $10 million. They don't get paid hourly, but if you break that down, say 80 hour weeks, 50, 50, hour, uh, 50 weeks a year, you're looking at somewhere around $3,000 an hour the market is valuating their time. Um, versus someone who's you know minimum wage pouring coffee kind of thing is is getting valued at 750, and they're both putting in roughly the same amount of time each day. So what is the difference between them? Well, economists when they look at who's earning what and why people are earning more, they have this concept called productivity, the productivity productivity of of, la of someone's work, and productivity is a pretty simple function. It's just a function of labor, the time you're putting in, mixed with capital. Um, so you take the same amount of labor, you mix it with more capital, and you get more productivity, more compensation. So if you think of someone who's, you know, earning minimum wage, their capital is a mop and you know a very basic level of training to to clean what they're cleaning is a low amount of capital, they're mixing it with their time, and they get low results financial-wise. Whereas a uh, you know, very highly compensated executive is putting in roughly the same hours, uh, but they are mixing those hours with an enormous amount of capital for each minute they're putting in. It's being mixed with an enormous amount of capital. Um, they have of course, their human capital, they have their training, both formal education uh, and their informal training, um, all their experience on the job. They have a Rolodex, which is a form of human capital, or it might be called social capital. Uh, then they have all the capital of the, the company. They have you know, executive teams that can put their vision, uh, execute on their vision. Um, they have all the financial resources of the company. So each minute is being uh, is being mixed with a lot of capital, and that's why more value gets created out of each minute. So what I want to do today, um, you all have a lot of human capital already in your expertise, your education, of course your experience, uh, but I want to give some really kind of guerrilla style bootstrapped ways you can start adding even more to your human capital so that each minute of your time, each hour you spend here, is mixed with more capital and therefore more valuable, and, and that your, your career will develop that much faster, your compensation, your earnings will develop that much faster. So I'm gonna talk about four main types of, kind of lean or bootstrapped human capital that we can all add to. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is sales. And that might sound a little bit crazy, uh, but a lot of you in the audience are engineers, uh, you may not ever in your career get in a position of formally selling something in the context of a business. Maybe some of you do, but my guess is probably most of you don't. So why would I be standing up here telling you that learning about sales is a valuable way to add to your human capital? Well, even if you're not selling a product for money, you know, all of us, all of you are working in a knowledge economy, a knowledge society here. And we'd like to think, so in, so in a certain sense, you're getting paid for your creativity and your ideas. And we'd like to think that the best ideas win, but we know in office politics, in just the way things work, that isn't always the case. 
the, the ideas that win are the best ideas multiplied by the best persuasion, the best influence, uh, the best sales, if you will, of those ideas. So formal education, which we've all had, I've had, teaches us about the ideas. It's a kind of pure idea environment where there's this very high premium on coming up with brilliant ideas. Um, but the thing that you don't tend to learn in a formal environment is how to pitch and sell and persuade those ideas to real world teams in the real world. And someone I interviewed for this book actually once went through the entire course catalog of Harvard, Stanford, and I think it was Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton business schools, and was looking for courses in sales. And there was not a single course in sales in the entire MBA catalogs of those three most prestigious uh, business MBA programs. Uh, there was one course in Salesforce management, which is very different than sales. Now, if you talk to the people I interviewed in my book, these self-made uh, millionaires, self-made billionaires, successful entrepreneurs, if you talk to them about what was behind their success, they are all, almost all very, very passionate about the concept of sales, both formal, traditional sales in the sense of selling things for money, but just as much sales in the sense of persuasion, in the sense of getting people excited about your ideas. And you all are very idealistic. You, have, you want to make a big impact on this company. You want to make a big impact in the world of tech, Silicon Valley. And what I'm putting forth to you is that your impact, the leverage point here, is actually going to be your persuasiveness in, in pitching your ideas. Now, one resistance that a lot of people have, and I used to have around the idea of learning sales or persuasion, is that it sounds you know, kind of manipulative. Like the word sales has uh, a bad ring to it. The word persuasion has a kind of manipulative ring to it. Um, and the truth is, there is a lot of really manipulative, cheesy, uh, low, kind of low-grade sales out there. And that's where we get that impression, is that it exists. Um, and you know, it has that kind of connotation of an encyclopedia salesman or a used car salesman. Well, I'm not here to tell you to learn that kind of sales. I promise that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, hopefully, or Wikipedia is basically already putting encyclopedia salesmen out of business. Maybe the Google car project will put used car salesmen out of business. We don't know. You could just order your car off the internet. Uh, if you guys do a good job on, your, on the algorithms, you could put insurance salesmen out of business, auto insurance salesmen, <laughs> uh, if, if these cars aren't crashing into, into each other. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. No more of that kind of sales. Um, the kind I'm talking about is high integrity, high integrity sales, and it does exist. Um, if you're somehow resisting the concept of learning to be more persuasive because you think it's kind of cheesy or manipulative, that is actually, I think, an excuse that is holding you back from furthering in your career. Because it, 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 there are ways to learn this stuff uh, that, are, that are high integrity, that are befitting of your careers, of the, of the Google brand. Um, so a very specific recommendation I want to make uh, is a book called Spin Selling, S-P-I-N Selling, by Neil Rackham. And this is, in my opinion, the best book on sales ever written. Uh, it's, as far as I know, the only book that is based on actual uh, observation of in-field sales sessions. And they were doing, they, they had a, a budget of a million dollars and I think, you know, dozens and dozens of researchers and they went all around the country observing in-field sales sessions of high ticket price items uh, that were considered major sales by the buyer. And what they found, fortunately for all of us, is that that kind of slickster manipulation uh, doesn't actually work. That's not, that's not what is ultimately persuasive in pitching your ideas to your teams, to, to people who are going to buy your ideas. And what works is two things, asking the right questions and listening very closely to the answers. And so that actually the more the person you're trying to persuade talks, the more likely you are to persuade them of your vision. Uh, and so sales becomes not a kind of cheesy pitch, but actually a human conversation where you're listening to your team, you're listening to what you want, and you're finding ways to, uh, to demonstrate that you really get 
what these people care about and that you're tailoring what you're pitching, what you're selling, quote unquote, to their needs. And when people get that feeling that you're tailoring that way, they listen and they're persuaded and your ideas start diffusing through your team and through the company. So, so there is one example of a, a very highly leveraged way to invest in your human capital. I just mentioned one book. I think it's probably you know 30 bucks at most. You can read it in a few evenings. You don't have to leave Google. You don't have to go into you know, a master or graduate program uh, and take on student debt to start making these kind of investments in, in your career. Um, you can do them in this kind of bootstrapped, on the fly way. So the second type of human capital I want to talk about today, the second type of investment is attention. Investing in the quality of your intention, attention. Now this is a huge issue in the tech world, in all of us who are involved with computers. We know, you know Facebook, Twitter, now Google Plus is just one more thing to keep us distracted in the day. You know, everyone, email, IM, text, message, everyone is struggling with this. I don't know anyone <clears throat> who's not struggling with issues of attention during their work day. And if you take two people who have roughly the same educational credentials, roughly the same training, technical knowledge, same background, and one of them has a fantastic attention, and it just gets to work, they've got a clear mind, they're focused, they can get right to work and not be distracted, and they're going throughout the day with a great level of energy and focus and attention, and you compare that to your kind of typical corporate worker who is you know, drinking three or four cups of coffee just to get awake in the morning, get started, is you know, distracted by all these social media things, doesn't really know where they're going in their work day, maybe has to have you know, another huge jolt of caffeine in the afternoon just to get through the day. You, know, you compare those two people, and the, the first person I mention is going to win in their career 10 times out of 10. So that's, a, again, another type of, of investing in your human capital that is highly leveraged in that there, it doesn't take a lot of money. This is stuff you can learn about. You can focus on your time and your money and your attention. And you can change yourself. And we, and, and we can all change ourselves this way. And it has a huge impact on our careers. And if you think again about you know, uh, or productivity as being ca labor times capital, so if you, have, you all have a certain amount of labor uh, that you're bringing to the table here, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. I don't know, you know quite how much all of you are spending each day, but it's a, it's a fixed amount. So we're talking about changing things in ourselves that makes each of those minutes you bring to the table more productive. And that ends up in, in just much, much higher career results. So I went, there's a lot of ways um, to focus on attention. I just saw a wonderful sign there about meditation. So there's techniques you can learn. I mean, there's a sign right there you could, you could check out about a meditation group. Um, there's a specific kind of investing in your attention span and your quality of your intention that I want to talk about that's, that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I had a pretty serious problem with this issue in my 20s. I'm 34. Um, Four years ago, on the eve of my 30th birthday, I was suicidal. And I had struggled throughout my 20s with bipolar 2, which is a, a pretty serious mental illness um, that involves really strong mood swings. So my attention was really either, it was one of two things. It was either super jacked up where I was like this and could barely contain myself, which was surprisingly actually hard to be productive because like my mind was just so, uh, so jacked up. Or I was in bed and I could barely get out of bed and, uh, and, and you know, pull the covers off of me. So neither of those was very conducive to good work. Um, and this stuff, if you think this stuff about attention is kind of airy-fairy and new age, it, it really isn't. It has a very direct correlation with your earnings. So uh, in the, the kind of darkest moments of that period, uh, I was working as a freelancer, and I earned in my lowest year eight thousand dollars in one year, um, and so because and I just wasn't able to bring quality attention to my hours in the day, and 
and it showed in my pocketbook. And the way I got out of this, it was a long story. I actually wrote an article uh, about it on Forbes. If you Google my name and, and Bipolar 2, I have a very detailed article about it. But I, it, essentially, I got out of this through better nutritional and eating habits. And I went through a whole gauntlet of, of doctors, psychiatrists. I was on all kinds of drugs. Uh, and eventually, I came to a doctor who knew that uh, nutrition, there were nutritional components to attention and to mood. And he told me specifically with these mood swings that, that sugar was a really big issue and blood sugar issues. And he told me to get off um, caffeine, alcohol, and refined sugar, uh, which I was all of them you know, consuming in rather high quantities. Um, I resisted this, uh, this advice for quite a while. I basically told him to F off and that I didn't want to live without those things. Um, eventually, it got really bad. As I mentioned, I was, I was literally on the verge of suicide. I was like, I need to make a change. I, may, I implemented what this doctor told me. Um, and within two weeks, my life had radically transformed. And so you don't need to be in the brinks of that level of darkness to have this effective. Um, Google is on the forefront, literally the forefront. I'm not saying this to, to flatter you. It's, it's actually true of p paying attention to people to workers nutrition as a as a component of their value in the company and the attention they're bringing and you know, Google has gotten deservedly a ton of great press about the healthy food that's available to you and the cafe and all of that but we can always do better we can always learn more this is a very high leverage way to increase the value of each minute you're bringing to your day is to get this part of your life handled to get your nutrition your health really handled and you know probably all of us could tick off uh, a, a list of the basic things you need to do to be healthy. You know, we all know it's basically eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, um, you know, cut down on refined sugars, cut down on alcohol consumption and caffeine consumption, get more exercise, get better sleep. You know, all of us know these things, but really the difference, you know, you, the difference is whether we implement them or not. So the, again, this is in some ways one of the fallacies of, of formal training and education is that it's really about like what you know and you can you do you know things intellectually and can you tick them off on a you know on a test but what you know is only part of the issue really it's what you put into practice and that is actually in some ways the the more challenging part and you we really have to train at these things i think it's an, there's an analogy to training like an athlete you actually have to train your taste buds your senses to respond to healthier eating um, and, and it is a training process um, I have another uh, specific recommendation, uh, a book that was very helpful to me in, in this process of transforming my own life. Uh, is called The Ultra Mind Solution by Dr. Mark Hyman. Uh, it's, he's an MD. Uh, it's very straightforward, scientifically based book on the nutritional aspects of mental performance and mental health. You're not, a lot of kind of books on alternative nutrition have woo-woo kind of new age concepts. So this is a very straight ahead book written by an MD. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. And again, this is the kind of thing, maybe that book is 15, 20 bucks. You can read it. You don't have to leave your job to bring this kind of education uh, into your life. And that's really what I've been talking about in this book is that I think institutions of higher learning have inappropriately monopolized the word education. They all undoubtedly provide very good education and important and valuable education. But that's all we think of when we think of the word education is going to school, you know, taking classes, getting a degree, getting advanced degrees. And we don't think about all the other ways that we can educate ourselves for oftentimes much less expensively and often much more relevant to what you're doing right now in your careers. There's just all these ways available to us and that's really what I, I interviewed all these people about was just the, the kind of more street smart ways that they went about educating themselves. Because this, this group that I talked to is really probably the group in the world that has the most success with the least formal credentials for those, that success. The most success of the least formal credentials. And so all of their success came in these more street smart, um, kind of practical intelligence type ways. So we've talked about uh, sales persuasion. Uh, we've talked about your attention. Um, the third one I want to talk about might 
rattle, uh, uh, ruffle some feathers, but I think it's really important, and that is what I call overcoming emotional liabilities. Uh, overcoming emotional liabilities. And I have a, a very technical definition of emotional liabilities. You might want to take notes on this technical definition. Um, I define an emotional liability as any emotional issue you haven't dealt with that could come back and bite you in the ass. <laughs> and we all have these, all of us. I definitely, definitely have these. All of us in this room have emotional liabilities. Usually we're not aware of them. Um, they're, another way you might think of them is blind spots. So um, everyone else is aware of them. I'm, I assure you your team is aware of your emotional liabilities. You're the only one who isn't. Uh, same thing goes for me. Um, one that I struggle with a lot. So th there's several kinds that I'll talk about. Um, that are very common in the work world. Um, one that I personally struggle with a lot is defensiveness, which is essentially being totally unopen to any kind of feedback around your improvement. My wife is laughing. <laughs> she, she is the one who is the mirror to my blind spots. So you know, she'll say something very reasonable, uh, you know, a, a very kind of normal wifely criticism of a husband, and I'll get extremely defensive, and I'll, I'll deny it, and I'll start criticizing her right back. And she's very patient. I'm very lucky to have such a patient wife who will just patiently, compassionately say, honey, you're doing that defensiveness thing again. And she's got to actually point it out to me, because when you're in the grips of it, you're actually not aware of it. It's, you're possessed by this, and you don't see it, but everyone else sees it. So defensiveness. Uh, another one that's extremely common in the work world is what I call a victim mentality. And I have a whole chapter about that in here. Um, I call it the entrepreneurial mindset versus the employee mindset. And these are mindsets. This is not about whether you're actually an entrepreneur or an employee. It's about mindset. And one thing that I noticed about all the people I interviewed is they seem to have a mindset in common. And I called that mindset the entrepreneurial mindset. And it's very relevant if you're an employee also. Um, and the, the essence of that mindset is a complete absence of any kind of victim mentality and, and a sense that these people are creating the results around them. They, they are the cause of the results. So if you're in a victim mentality, you know, everyone else is the cause of your results, of your bad results. So if, you're, if your team doesn't do well in the project, oh, well, it's my team members. They didn't get that, that piece of programming, that piece of code in on time. Um, you know, all, all those kind of excuses that we always hear. So you're not, you're not really the cause of the bad things in your life. But the problem with that is it throws the baby out with the bathwater. If you're adopting this mentality where, where everything else is a cause, then you're not really the cause of the good things in your life either. And so the people I interviewed have a, a very different mindset around this. And it, I think it stems from them being entrepreneurs, where if you're an entrepreneur and you're, you know, one of your employees screws up, you know, some, maybe some entrepreneurs say, oh, well, the employee is terrible. It's their fault. That's why we messed up. But those kind of entrepreneurs don't last very long. The ones that are successful say, OK, this is my fault. I created this. Either I made a bad hiring decision, in which case I need to fix that, or I didn't provide the leadership necessary to have that employee do the right thing. So I'm in control. I'm in the driver's seat. I'm creating my reality. You know, there's a lot of cheesy stuff out there about this issue, kind of law of attraction, and you know, you create your own reality. Um, I think for a lot of things, that gets overblown um, and overhyped, and, and you can fairly have s skepticism about some of the more you know, extreme new age ways that this gets expressed in kind of like that movie, The Secret. But just on a basic level, um, overcoming this emotional liability of I'm a victim, um, other people are screwing me over in my career. You know, if, if just that one employee, if just that one boss did something different, then I'd get the results I want. Oh, that's an emotional liability. And, and learning to overcome that uh, is is very, very powerful way to invest in your own human capital. So if you, if you think about the most successful uh, think about the best leader you can imagine, either a boss you've had or just kind of an idealization of your perfect boss leader. So this person is um, you know, highly inspiring, highly motivating, makes you want to work for her, makes you want to bring out your best 
to, to perform for the vision she's setting out, um, is giving you really hard hitting solid feedback, but done in a very compassionate way that's not aimed at cutting you down, but rather in helping you grow. So if you think about you know, the, the most inspiring leader like that, and we've all probably had one or two in, in some context or another, you know, that person has overcome a lot of their emotional liabilities, because we've all got them from childhood. Um, you know, I had, my mother is here also. I had a, a very happy childhood. But you know, just from just normal growing up stuff, we've all got this baggage that we carry around. And if we don't let, if learn to let go of the baggage, it will come back to bite us in the ass, and it will affect, this is not airy-fairy new age stuff, it will affect your bottom line. And so, Again, on the theme of specific takeaways, on this one, emotional liabilities, it's very hard to do just on your own, because as we said, they're, they're blind spots, so you need feedback. And I'm a very big believer in executive coaching. Uh, I'm, I'm almost like a, a religious convert to executive coaching. Um, it's transformed my own life, my own earning power. Um, I mentioned in kind of the darkest days of, of my professional life, I earned $8,000 in one year. Um, that was just about four or five years ago until I finally got my health issues taken care of, which is the second kind of human capital we talk about. And then I was in a place to start, once I got my health taken care of, to start focusing on my money. And I said, you know what, I, I, can't, I can't be in this place any longer. I've got to get my money handled. And I'm not going to attract the, you know, no, no woman that I want to spend my life with is going to want to be you know, married to such a financial basket case. And this is before I, I met Jenna, and I really had my vision that I needed to get this handled to, to meet the kind of partner that I wanted to have in my life. So I invested, and it was literally a financial investment in really high quality coaching. And there's all kinds of workshops out there, um, you know, coaching you can get. Again, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of BS out there. Um, a lot, I would say, I'm probably going to you know, piss some people off who are listening to this on the video, but I would say 80% of coaches I've come across are pretty messed up in their own life, and they're using coaching as a way to like sort out their own life by coaching other people. Um, that's a really, really common meme um, <laughs> that you'll see out there. So you got to find the people who aren't like that, who actually have their stuff already handled, and who can help you get, get your emotional liabilities handled. Um, what's the best way to, to find them? Uh, referrals is always the best way, I think. You know, find people who have got this stuff handled. Find people who are where you want to be. Find, whether in this company or elsewhere in the valley, you know, find people who are where you want to be and, and f ask who they learn from. What books did they read? What teachers did they have? What mentors did they have? You know, and it's possible that those people teach workshops, teach classes. Um, I'll make two recommendations right here if you're looking for specific recommendations. I have no, you know, I'm not like an affiliate or anything of these people. I, I have no benefit from recommending them. But one is actually a, a former Googler, uh, Jenny Blake, um, who used to organize this Authors at Google series. And she was an executive coach here at Google. And she decided to go out and do it full time herself. Um, she is great. I've, I've, she's helped me a lot. Um, she's a friend now. Uh, I actually pay an executive coach also. So there's a mix of, of informal and formal. So you, know, you, ha you can find mentors, which is a form of coaching. But I really do believe in investing with your wallet um, and, and paying for some executive coaching. Um, I pay for an executive coach. He's a guy called Peter Shallard, S-H-A-L-L-A-R-D. He goes by the moniker, the shrink for entrepreneurs. And uh, I think we're all, whether employees or not, we all live in an entrepreneurial environment. We all need some kind of shrink, quote unquote. Um, and so you know, go out and find, find one that works for you and make that investment. Um, you know, a good executive coach, the kind of going rate for a really good one who knows what they're doing is about $1,000 a month. And that may sound like a lot, but compare that, for example, to going back to uh, you know, getting a master's degree. Um, that could be $50,000 a year is, is for a good program, plus foregone earnings. That could be another fifty dollars to $100,000 a year in foregone earnings. Much of that will be put on debt, uh, so you know there's going to be interest associated with the debt. So you're looking at possibly $150,000 a year uh, to get that kind of that kind of formal 
increase in your human capital. Whereas a really good executive coach might be one-tenth of that in a year. It's going to be a form of education, but highly tailored to your specific uh, needs and your specific circumstances. Um, and, and again, this is like a more kind of guerrilla lean style where you don't have to leave your job. It is, you know, this is done in dialogue with your job, this kind of education. And, you know, all the people I talk to in this book um, are really, really big believers in the power of, of mentorship. And, and since they didn't have formal education, since they didn't have professors, they had to go and find their professors in the world. So I have a chapter, um, the second chapter in the book is a kind of step-by-step -step way to go and how to find informal mentors who can help you with these issues and, and help us get to that that higher, more clean level of leadership where we're not getting triggered and kind of weighed down by, by emotional baggage issues. So that's a third kind of human capital investment. And uh, the last type of human capital that I'm gonna talk about today is meaning and bringing meaning to our careers. And uh, I have another you know, pretty serious personal story around this. Um, after dealing with that whole bipolar health issue, and I, I, I got out of it, I got out alive, um, pretty soon after that, uh, I got diagnosed with testicular cancer about two and a half years ago. And um, knock on wood, you know, I, got the, uh, I got the surgery. Four days after I found out about it, I was on a surgery table. I got the surgery. Everything seems to be okay now. So I, I am a cancer survivor of two and a half years. And it's, it's kind of cliched or, or cheesy, but there's something about being diagnosed with a potentially fatal illness that gives you a permission slip to really start thinking about these big issues. Like, what does my life mean? What, what do I really want to, what impact do I really want to make here on the planet? And so I, I thought about those a lot you know, during the time of, of the surgery and after. And I, I've, pay, I've just spent a lot of time thinking about those issues. And to me, it's actually kind of sad that it takes, it generally takes a life-threatening illness to, for us to give ourselves permission to start thinking about these issues in our life. You know, Steve Jobs um, just, uh, just stepped down from his you know, incredible tenure of leadership. There's a really beautiful um, commencement speech he gave in 2005 to Stanford where he talks about this, and he, he talks about his cancer diagnosis and, and how he started thinking about these big picture issues facing death. And my hope is that we all in this room don't have to face those issues for a very long time, that we all live very, very healthy, long lives. But I, I want us to give ourselves permission to think about those issues without facing mortality and do it now. And again, this is not... A, this is not an airy-fairy concept. It has direct relevance to your success in your career. So if you take two people, again, same educational background, same training, same technical skills, one of them is just sort of showing up for work. You know, hey, Google's a cool place to work. You get this free food. You know, it sounds cool on my resume. And that's their kind of relation to their work. Not a lot of meaning. And you take someone else who is, has a very clear d sense of what they want to accomplish on this planet, of what impact they want to have made in their company, in the industry, in the world, through their work. You know, which one of those two people is going to be promoted faster? Which one is going to, is going to advance in their career? Which one is going to earn more over their career? It's, it's really clear that the latter one will. So I'm going to give you my definition of meaning and how we can add more to it. I'm sure that you did not expect coming you know, at 12 p.m. at a lunchtime talk to get a definition of the meaning of life, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you mine right here from a lot of reflection. Um, the way I like to think about it is that the way we can add more meaning to our lives and our career is uh, meaning is making a difference in the lives of people you care about making a difference in the lives of people you care about. And there's two components to that, making a difference and the people you care about. And both of those components need to be there um, for a sense of, of meaning. Um, so yeah, I have two of the most important people in my life here, uh, my mother who gave me life, my wife who gives me life every day in, in inspiration. And you know, these are people I deeply, deeply care about. 
and um, Jenna and I just had our one year wedding anniversary um, and a year ago, a little over a year ago, I was giving her my vows in the wedding and I said, Jenna, I vow to you that if you're ever in danger, if you're ever in harm's way, I will sacrifice everything. I will sacrifice even my own life to protect you and to get you out of harm. And I, I meant those words and there's very few people on the planet I would say those words to, but I said them to Jenna that day. And that is a level of meaning that I'm talking about here. That's a level of care. And we all have that in our families. We all have that with people we love, whether it's a spouse or significant other, children, uh, siblings, parents. And so we, we kind of get this in our personal life, that that's what gives us meaning, is, is making a difference. On that difference point, it's not just caring. It's also, this is, Jenna is someone I, I care deeply about, and I know I'm making a difference in her life. I know that, that her life is very different because I'm in it and we have a relationship, and it goes both ways. My life is completely different and pretty much unrecognizable uh, because of Jenna's care and, and the difference she's making on me. So it's the, the caring and the making a difference. So how does this translate into the professional realm? Well, the, the level of care m may or may not be that intense, but you all work with people. You know, we like to think, we may think that we're here because of technical skills, because of you know, training background, but nothing gets done without people. And you all work on teams, and you know, presumably you care about your teams. And there's an analogy here. Um, if, you, if you interview soldiers about why they fight, you know, why they put up with these horrendous hellish, con hellish conditions, um, why, what keeps them going day after day on no sleep, risking their life every day. If you interview people like that about why they do it, uh, you know, they, they may say something about the cause or the reason they're fighting or their country, but if you really dig deep and read the interviews with them, almost always they're talking about their, their teammates, their, their fellow soldiers, and this profound love and care they have for the people that are on their side. And it's, it's a very elemental thing in our psychology, this, this caring for teams. So the more you learn how to get in touch with why you're here, why you care about what you're doing, the people you care about, and getting really, really inspired by making a difference in what they're doing, the more powerful your career is going to be, the more powerful each minute of your labor, which is fixed, you, know, you only have a certain amount of it each day. So we're talking about how to make it the most effective. The more each minute of that labor is going to be powerful. And there's not really like books or things you can do. I mean, this is inquiry. This is internal inquiry that we all have to do. And it tends to get put aside for, for other types of investing. So you know, people, when they think of investing, they think of stocks, bonds, real estate, portfolios. Uh, you know, the, a common benchmark is that you're supposed to put 10% of your um, pre-tax earnings into you know, retirement and that kind of savings and investment. So that's roughly 10% of your energy going towards that kind of investment. But we never ever talk about these, giving ourselves time for these kind of investments in our human capital. And the, the people I talked to for the last two years this is their focus. I mean, these are masters, masters of investing in their own human capital in very inexpensive ways without having to go into debt, um, without having to take out student loans. Again, I'm not trying to bash those things. All of you have probably done a lot of that in your life. I'm just trying to, uh, to expand the conversation in a direction that it hasn't gone very much. <clears throat> So, in closing, I hope that this talk has inspired you to change the way you view of the concept of investing. That the, all of the things I'm talking about are actual investments of things that matter to you. I mean, even more than time, what's more valuable to all of us, excuse me, even more than money, what's more valuable to all of us than money is time. And all of these things are going to get take time. I'm not uh, you know, minimizing the amount of time that these things are going to take. To learn to be a more persuasive communicator about your ideas. To learn to increase the quality of your attention at, through health, better health habits. Uh, to learn, you know, to get over these emotional baggage issues that we all have. 
um, to, to, to do this deep inquiry into what is meaningful for you about your career, why you show up every day other than just collecting a paycheck. This is all gonna take time, but in my view, these are extremely powerful, lucrative ways to invest your time, your energy, and your money. Thank you so much. Um, so we have some time for, let me just see how much time we have here. Uh, we have some time for about 10 minutes for questions, so any questions from the audience? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so thank you for the, the talk. Um, one of the things though, when you're talking about attention, you kind of gave these two examples. Um, you know, the person who comes in has to drink, you know, a ton of coffee, just to kind of wake up and then the person is kind of naturally there and they're fully focused. I mean, those are two rather extreme examples. Right. And I don't, I think probably the majority of people here fall kind of into the middle. You right. know, they need, they know they need to focus. They're trying to focus. Um, but you know, distractions still come, still come up. Um, do you have any kind of thoughts or specific things that you do or th that some of the people in your book do to actually be able to maintain that focus for you know, extended periods of time at work amidst all the distractions? Right. Right. Um, so the question, if you didn't hear it, is you know, probably all of us in this room are more in the middle of that range I gave, that we're not in complete basket cases with our attention, but how can we, how, even if we're in the middle of that road, how can we improve even further? Um, so there's, there's sort of the street eye view and the bird's eye view. Um, the, a lot of the books out there on this topic, you know, really popular one in the tech world is Getting Things Done by David Allen. Um, you know, could be useful for you. Um, it, it focuses on really kind of day-to-day -day strategies of this kind of stuff. The, the issue I have with that book and those kind of books is that they tend to be very good about what, how you should plan your tasks but they don't really get you thinking that much about which tasks you should be doing uh, and, and which one are gonna have the highest impact. And I actually think, again, that that inquiry into your meaning about the, like what, you really, what are the really important things you wanna be accomplishing here, that is a big picture kind of inquiry that can, that can cut out like 80% of the, the low level tasks that you have to do if you really get in touch with that meaning. Um, on the more street eye view, um, a system, it, this is an area I'm still working on a lot. Um, a system that I have found very useful is called the Pomodoro technique. Has anyone heard of that one? Um, if you look it up, Pomodoro, there's a lot of stuff of it online. It come, the name comes from the uh, Pomodoro kitchen timers, those you know, tomatoes that you twist and it you know, tick tocks in the kitchen. And the idea is that it's, it's basically a timer, and you can get digital versions of this, that uh, goes for 25 minutes. And in, in 25 minutes, you focus on one thing. And, and you turn off all the email and the notifications and the Facebook and Google Plus and all those things. You focus on one thing for 25 minutes, the timer goes off, you get a five minute break and you can do whatever you want. You can go and get tea, you can make some cell phone calls, you can check your Facebook. Then the timer goes off in five minutes, you go back to 25. You, that cycle, they call it a Pomodoro. You do four of those Pomodoros, which is roughly two hours, and then you can take a longer break. And I've found that to be really, really effective in my own life. Um, I work, I'm self-employed, I work uh, at home, so I don't have like a team that's kind of keeping me on track. So I, I have needed to implement something like this to stay, to stay on track. Um, but you know, there's, there's all kinds of things out there like that available to you um, really cheaply. The, and, and I guess my big picture point is to not view those things as like extras. Like, well, maybe if I have some time, I'll, I'll learn those things. Like these are things that are going to make your labor more valuable next week, the week after that, day after day, month after month, and you will see the results in your career and in your earnings and in the leadership you're able to take. There's books uh, available over there at Google.